Hi. Well, as threatened, I am planning to read William Saroyan's novel, The Human Comedy. Um, this is um, my my copy. It's a uh, it was a it's a novel that Saroyan um, wrote in 1943. And for those of you who don't know William Saroyan or know much about him, um, he for my money is truly one of the best writers of the of the 20th century. Um, he wrote, um, gosh, I, beginning in the 20s and well into, you know, into the, oh, I, I don't have exact dates. Um, you can look him up on Wikipedia if you want detailed information. Um, but he was, um, he was a writer of fiction, um, of plays, and uh, I believe screenplays as well. Um, and he, in 1943, he published The Human Comedy. Uh, it was made into a movie with Mickey Rooney, and um, it's about a family, um, and in particular, um, that one son of theirs who was a, was a telegraph messenger boy in the, um, in the early years of, of World War II. Um, it's, I think one of the best stories of community and the way that people pull together in, um, in hard times um, and in times that when, you know, the unimaginable is happening around them and often to them. So I thought it might be kind of salient. Um, keeping in mind, um, for people who don't read a lot of fiction that was written in other periods than the, than the very contemporary, um, that that um, there may be occasionally things that seem archaic or um, you know sometimes maybe even a little jarring um, to our modern ears, but that um, that this was this book, like all novels, um, was a product of its time. Um, <coughs> uh, William Saroyan um, was an Armenian American. Um, he was raised in the Fresno area, and his parents immigrated from Armenia, as as did many of the people in the community that he lived in. So um, that so we see um, a great deal of of that kind of culture also in this book. Uh, so anyway, here we go. Uh, the human comedy. He dedicated the book to his mother, and I'd like to read the dedication because. It tells you a lot about him and a lot about his mother and a lot about their relationship. And then what I'm going to do is read like three chapters at a time, three or four chapters at a time um, over until it's done. I think it's probably we're going to be looking at about maybe 10, 10 or 12 different readings. Anyway, the human comedy. Um, he dedicates it. This story is for Takuhi Saroyan. I have taken all this time to write a story especially for you because I have wanted it to be... Oh, God. Sorry, reading glasses. Um, here I go. Um, I have taken all this time to write a story especially for you because I have wanted it to be an especially good story, the very best I might ever be able to write. And now, at last, a little pressed for time, I have tried... I might have waited longer still, but as there is no telling what's next or what skill or inclination will be left after everything else, I have hurried a little and taken a chance on my present skill and inclination. Soon, I hope, someone wonderful will translate the story into Armenian so that it will be in print you know well. In translation, the story may read better than it does in English, and, as you have done before, maybe you will want to read some of it to me, even though I wrote this stuff in the first place. If so, I promise to listen and to marvel at the beauty of our language, so little known by others and so much less appreciated by anyone than, you, than by you. As you cannot read and enjoy English as well as you read and enjoy Armenian, and I cannot read or write Armenian at all, we can only hope for a good translator. One way or another, though, this story is for you. I hope you like it. I have written it as simply as possible with that blending of the severe and the light-hearted, which is especially yours and our families. The story is not enough, I know, but what of that? 
It will surely seem enough to you, since your son wrote it and meant so well. W.S. It's illustrated. Um, here's a, this is one of the characters, Ulysses, a four-year-old boy. And it is with Ulysses that the book opens. First, the sip of beer. Chapter 1, Ulysses. The little boy named Ulysses Macaulay one day stood over the new gopher hole in the backyard of his house on Santa Clara Avenue in Ithaca, California. The gopher of this hole pushed up fresh, moist dirt and peeked out at the boy, who was certainly a stranger but perhaps not an enemy. Before this miracle had been fully enjoyed by the boy, one of the birds of Ithaca flew into the old walnut tree in the backyard and after settling itself on a branch, broke into rapture, moving the boy's fascination from the earth to the tree. Next, best of all, a freight train puffed and roared far away. The boy listened and felt the earth beneath him tremble with the moving of the train. Then he broke into running, moving, it seemed to him, swifter than any life in the world. When he reached the crossing, he was just in time to see the passing of the whole train from locomotive to caboose. He waved to the engineer, but the engineer did not wave back to him. He waved to five others who were with the train, but not one of them waved back. They might have done so, but they didn't. At last, a Negro appeared, leaning over the side of a gondola. Above the clatter of the train, Ulysses heard the man singing, Weep no more, my lady, oh, weep no more today. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for the old Kentucky home far away. Ulysses waved to the Negro, too, and then a wondrous and unexpected thing happened. This man, black and different from all the others, waved back to Ulysses, shouting, Going home, boy! Going back where I belong! The small boy and the Negro waved to one another until the train was almost out of sight. Then Ulysses looked around. There it was, all around him, funny and lonely, this world of his life. The strange, weed-infested, junky, wonderful, senseless, yet beautiful world. Walking down the track came an old man with a rolled bundle on his back. Ulysses waved to this man, too, but the man was too old and too tired to be pleased with a small boy's friendliness. The old man glanced at Ulysses as if both he and the boy were already dead. The little boy turned slowly and started for home. As he moved, he still listened to the passing of the train, the singing of the Negro, and the joyous words, Going home, boy, going back where I belong. He stopped to think of all of this, loitering beside a china ball tree and kicking at the yellow, smelly, fallen fruit of it. After a moment, he smiled the smile of the Macaulay people, the gentle, wise, secret smile, which said yes to all things. When he turned the corner and saw the Macaulay house, Ulysses began to skip, kicking up a heel. He tripped and fell because of his merriment, but got to his feet and went on. His mother was in the yard, throwing feed to the chickens. She watched the boy trip and fall and get up and skip again. He came quickly and quietly and stood beside her, and then went to the hen nest to look for eggs. He found one. He looked at it a moment, picked it up, brought it to his mother, and very carefully handed it to her, by which he meant what no man can guess and what no child can remember to tell. Chapter 2, Homer. Oh, here's the, uh, the illustration of Homer. <clears throat> His brother Homer sat on the seat of a second-hand bicycle which struggled bravely with the dirt of a country road. Homer Macaulay wore a telegraph messenger's coat which was far too big and a cap which was not quite big enough. The sun was going down in a somnolence of evening peace, deeply cherished by the people of Ithaca. All about the messenger orchards and vineyards rested 
in the old earth, old, old earth of California. Even though he was moving along swiftly, Homer was not missing any of the charm of the region. Look at that, he kept saying to himself, of earth and tree, sun and grass and cloud. Look at that, will you? He began to make decorations with the movement of his bike, and to accompany these ornaments of movement, he burst out with a shouting of music, simple, lyrical, and ridiculous. The theme of this opera was taken over in his mind by the strings of an orchestra, then supplemented by the harp of his mother and the piano of his sister Bess. And finally, to bring the whole family together, an accordion came into the group, saying the music with a smiling and somber sweetness as Homer remembered his brother Marcus. Homer's music fled before the hurrying clatter of three incredible objects moving across the sky. The messenger looked up at these objects and promptly rode into a small dry ditch. Airplanes, Homer said to himself. A farmer's dog came swiftly and with great importance, barking like a man with a message. Homer ignored the message, turning only once to spoof the animal by saying, Arp! Arp! He seated himself on the bicycle again and rode on. When he reached the beginning of the residential district of the city, he passed a sign without reading it. Ithaca, California, East, West, home is best. Welcome, stranger. He stopped at the next corner to behold a long line of army trucks full of soldiers roll by. He saluted the men, just as his brother Ulysses had waved to the engineer and the hobos. A great many soldiers returned the messenger's salute. Why not? What did they know of anything? Chapter three, the telegraph office. Let's see, illustration. It was evening in Ithaca when Homer finally drew up in front of the telegraph office. The clock in the window said two minutes past seven. Inside the office, Homer saw Mr. Spangler, the manager of the telegraph office, counting the words of a telegram which a tired-looking, troubled young man of twenty or so had just handed him. As he came into the office, Homer listened to Mr. Spangler and the young man. Fourteen words collect, Spangler said. He paused a moment, glancing at the boy. A little short of money? The boy couldn't reply immediately, but soon he said, Yes, sir, a little, but my mother will send me enough to get home on. Sure, Spangler said. Where have you been? Nowhere, I guess, the boy said and began to cough. How long will it take the telegram to get to my mother? Well, Spangler said, it's pretty late in the east now. It's not easy to raise money late at night sometimes, but I'll rush the telegram right through. Without looking at the boy again, Spangler went through his pockets, coming out with a handful of small coins, one piece of currency, and a hard-boiled egg. Here, he said, just in case, he handed the boy the currency. You can pay me back when your mother sends the money, he said. He indicated the egg. I picked it up in a bar seven days ago. Brings me luck. The boy looked at the money. What's this, he said. It's nothing, Spangler said. Thanks, the boy said. He stopped, amazed and embarrassed. Thanks, he said again and hurried out of the office. Spangler took the telegram over to William Grogan the night shift telegraph operator and wire chief. Send it paid, Willie, he said. I'll pay for it myself. Mr. Grogan put his hand around the bug and began rattling off the telegram, letter by letter. Mrs. Margaret Strickman, 1874 Biddle Street, York, Pennsylvania. Dear Ma, please telegraph $30. Want to come home. Am fine. Everything okay. John. Homer Macaulay studied the delivery desk to see what was on hand for delivery or if there were any calls to take. Mr. Spangler watched him with deadpan fascination and then spoke to him. How do you like being a messenger? He said. How do I like it? Homer said. I like it better than anything. You sure get to see a lot of different people. You sure get to see a lot of different places. Yeah, Spangler said. He paused to look at the boy a little closer. How did you sleep last night? Fine, Homer said. I was pretty tired, but I slept fine. Did you sleep a little at school today? A little. What subject? Ancient history. 
What about sports? Spangler said. I mean, what about not being able to take part in them on account of having this job? I take part in them, Homer said. We have a physical education period every day. Is that so? Spangler said. I used to run the 220 low hurdles when I went to Ithaca High. Valley champion. The manager of the telegraph office paused and then went on. You really like this job, don't you? I'm going to be the best messenger this office ever had, Homer said. Okay, Spangler said. Just don't kill yourself. Don't go too fast. Get there swiftly, but don't go too fast. Be polite to everybody. Take your hat off in elevators. And above all things, don't lose a telegram. Yes, sir. Working nights is different from working days, Spangler went on. Taking a telegram to Chinatown or out to the sticks is liable to scare a fellow. Well, don't let it scare you. People are people. Don't be scared of them. How old are you? Homer gulped. Sixteen, he said. Yeah, I know, Spangler said. You said that yesterday. We're not supposed to hire a boy unless he's at least sixteen, but I thought I'd take a chance on you. How old are you? Fourteen, Homer said. Well, Spangler said, you'll be sixteen in two years. Yes, sir, Homer said. If anything comes up that you don't understand, Spangler said, come to me. Yes, sir, Homer said. He paused. What about singing telegrams? Nothing to them, Spangler said. We don't get many of them. You've got a pretty good voice, haven't you? I used to sing at the First Presbyterian Sunday School of Ithaca, Homer said. That's fine, Spangler said. That's exactly the kind of voice we need for our singing telegrams. Now, let's say Mr. Grogan over there was sent a birthday greeting. How would you do it? Homer went over to Mr. Grogan and sang, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Grogan, happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mr. Grogan said. That's fine, Spangler said to Homer, but you wouldn't say dear Grogan, you'd say dear Mr. Grogan. What are you going to do with the $15 a week? Give it to my mother, Homer said. All right, Spangler said, from now on you're working. Steady. You're part of this outfit. Watch things, listen carefully, keep your eyes and ears open. The manager of the telegraph office looked away at nothing a moment and then said, what future have you mapped out for yourself? Future? Homer said. He was a little embarrassed because all his life, from day to day, he had been busy mapping out a future, even if it was only a future for the next day. Well, he said, I, I don't know for sure, but I guess I'd like to be somebody someday. Maybe a composer or somebody like that. Someday. That's fine, Spangler said, and this is the place to start. Music all around you, real music, straight from the world, straight from the hearts of people. Hear those telegraph keys? Beautiful music. Yes, sir, Homer said. Spangler asked suddenly, you know where Char Chatterton's Bakery is on Broadway? Here's a quarter. Go get me two day-old pies, apple and coconut cream, two for a quarter. Yes, sir, Homer said. He caught the quarter. Mr. He caught the quarter Spangler tossed to him and ran out of the office. Spangler looked after him, moving along into idle, pleasant, nostalgic dreaming. When he came out of the dream, he turned to the telegraph operator and said, What do you think of him? He's a good boy, Mr. Grogan said. I think he is, Spangler said. Comes from a good poor family on Santa Clara Avenue. No father, brother in the army, Mother works in the packing houses in the summer. Sister goes to state college. He's a couple of years under age is all. I'm a couple over age, Mr. Grogan said. We'll get along. Spangler got up from his desk. If you want me, he said, I'll be at Corbett's. Share the pies between you. He stopped and stared dumbfounded as Homer came running into the office with the two wrapped up pies. What's your name again? Spangler almost shouted at the boy. Homer Macaulay, Homer said. The manager of the telegraph office put his arm around the new messenger. All right, Homer Macaulay, he said. You're the boy this office needs on the night shift. You're probably the fastest moving thing in the San Joaquin Valley. You're going to be a great man someday, too, if you live. So see to it that you live. 
He turned and left the office while Homer tried to understand the meaning of what the man had said. All right, Mr. Grogan said. The pies! Homer put the pies on the desk beside Mr. Grogan, who continued to talk. Homer Macaulay, he said, my name is William Grogan. I am called Willie, however, although I am 67 years old. I am an old-time telegrapher and one of the last in the world. I am also Nightwire chief of this office. I am also a man who has memories of many wondrous worlds gone by. I am also hungry. Let us feast together on these pies, the apple and the coconut cream. From now on, you and I are friends. Yes, sir, Homer said. The old telegraph operator broke open one of the pies and broke it into four parts, and they began to eat coconut cream. I shall, on occasion, Mr. Grogan said, ask you to run an errand for me, to join me in song, or to sit and talk to me. In the event of drunkenness, I shall expect of you a depth of understanding one may not expect from men past twelve. How old are you? Fourteen, Homer said, but I guess I've got a pretty good understanding. Very well, Mr. Grogan said, I'll take your word for it. Every night in this office I shall count on you to see that I shall be able to perform my duties. A splash of cold water in the face if I do not respond when shaken. This is to be followed by a cup of hot black coffee from Corbett's. Yes, sir, Homer said. On the street, however, Grogan continued, the procedure is quite another thing. If you behold me wrapped in the embrace of alcohol, greet me as you pass, but make no reference to my happiness. I am a sensitive man and prefer not to be the object of public solicitude. Cold water and coffee in the office, Homer said, greeting in the street. Yes, sir. Mr. Grogan went on, his mouth full of coconut cream. Do you feel this world is going to be a better place after the war? Homer thought a moment and then said, yes, sir. Do you like coconut cream? Mr. Grogan said, yes, sir. Homer said. The telegraph box rattled. Mr. Grogan answered the call and took his place at the typewriter, but went on talking. I, too, am fond of coconut cream, he said. Also music, especially singing. I believe I overheard you say that once upon a time you sang at Sunday school. Please be good enough to sing one of the Sunday school songs while I type this message from Washington, D.C. Homer sang Rock of Ages while Mr. Grogan typed the telegram. It was addressed to Mrs. Rosa Sandoval, 1129 G Street, Ithaca, California, and in the telegram, the War Department informed Mrs. Sandoval that her son, Juan Domingo Sandoval, had been killed in action. Mr. Grogan handed the message to Homer. He then took a long drink from the bottle he kept in the drawer beside his chair. Homer folded the telegram, put it in an envelope, sealed the envelope, put the envelope in his cap, and left the office. When the messenger was gone, the old telegraph operator lifted his voice, singing Rock of Ages. For once upon a time, he too had been as young as any man. So, chapters one through three, I will continue in the next installment with chapters four through, probably four, five, and six. Good night.